And what a beautiful day the Lord has given us. And um, even if the day was dreary and dark and gray, uh, whatever, uh, it still would be a great day because Jesus is alive and uh, he's alive and well. And we can have confidence in him and in him alone. Trust that you are encouraged. Our, I'm reminded of what the psalmist said. He talked about great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, that he thought high things of God. And if you find yourself in a low point of life, think high things of God. And I will ensure you, assure you, based on the word of God, that he will, as, as the writer of the Old Testament said, of one book of the Old Testament, he says, he will keep you in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. We have finished, by the grace of God, our series of messages through the book of Haggai, and our title of those messages was Unfinished Business, and we finished that business, okay, we finished that business of uh, that text. Uh, however, as it ended, uh, it, 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 the book itself, it finished with the servant of God, Zerubbabel, uh, being declared as one whom Christ would uh, typify uh, to bring that eternal kingdom in. I look forward to a day where Jesus would do a great work and he would certainly establish his earthly kingdom in righteousness and in all justice. But in between those times, we are on the march in that direction, and there is unfinished business that still must take place. So having said that, I ask that you return with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. If you start at Psalms, okay, and work your way back, okay, you have Job, long book. Then before Job, you have the small book of Esther. Then go one book back, then you have the book of Nehemiah. If you get to the book of Ezra going backwards, you're going too far, okay? Nehemiah after Ezra. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, then Job. If you found it, say amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. The seventh chapter of Nehemiah, verses 1 through 6. It reads as follows. Then it was, when the wall was built, that I had hung the doors. When the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani, and Hananiah the brother of the citadel. For he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I said to them, do not... Let the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot, and while they stand guard, let them shut and bar the doors, and appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. Now the city was large and spacious, and but, but the people in it were few. And the houses were not rebuilt. Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers, and the people that they might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return. That refers to the return led by Zerubbabel. You remember Zerubbabel from the book of Haggai. Referring to this return. 
and I found written in it, these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity, of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away, and who returned to Jerusalem and Jer Judah, everyone to his city. We'll stop the reading of the word for our text today. Uh, pray with me, if you will. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today and what you have given to us in this time to, Lord, to hear from you. Pray, Father, you give us attentive minds. Give us eager, hungry hearts for you. Pray, Lord, for just for these few minutes, you would God, keep us attuned to your voice. Let the voice of your servant be your voice. Pray that your people, all of us, Father, will hear a voice that's stronger than my voice, that resonates deeper, Father God, than the magnification the system that in this building. We pray, Father God, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer and all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. I want to use as a thought for today's message, the unfinished business of building the people. The unfinished business of building the people. Fast forward 90 years from the time of Haggai, led by Zerubbabel, we're now a couple of generations removed. Uh, the temple in its current form exists, but there's still much that needs to be done. We're in the book of Nehemiah. If you know anything about Nehemiah, it, it starts with the building of a wall, right? You have the city of Jerusalem and the, and the people. Uh, not many people are living inside the city because the city, although the temple is, is built, it, it still is it's not in good condition. So Nehemiah, led by the Spirit of God on the heavy burden, he leaves his high position, his well-established very secure job as, as the cupbearer for the king. He leaves Shushan, the capital, goes back to Jerusalem and helps them to rebuild the wall. And if you look in this um, text uh, preceding what we've just read in chapter 6, verse 15, it says the wall was finished in just 52 days. Imagine that, 52 days. So therefore, the people of God had experienced a great Victory. Temple had been built about 90 years earlier. Now the wall has been built. And, and you know, my friends, the greatest threat uh, to a great victory uh, is the failure that one can fall into after that great victory. You see, gaining victory today is not a guarantee of a repeat victory tomorrow. You see, we can be victorious in one battle, but lose the next one. Some people are victorious in coming to faith in Christ, but lose the battle in living a, a life that is growing in Christ. So, some people are victorious in preparing themselves for a good, a good career, but lose the battle and being able to maintain a stable home. Some people are victorious in serving Christ and see him work, but lose the battle of steadfast commitment. It takes great faith, focus, and fortitude to keep a winning record. Nehemiah and the Jewish people, they had experienced a great victory. They had seen the powerful and the providential hand of God working through them to build the wall around Jerusalem. 
They had overcome threats from the enemy. They had overcome the ridicule, the discouragement, the deception, the death threats, even internal strife. The proof of God's hand was was mighty upon them. Impressive that they finished this work in just 52 days. That's less than two months. Imagine that, if you will, 52 days without the modern technology of cranes, of of dump trucks or cement trucks or or brick-laying robotics. Just the people of God led in unity, are working in unity, led by a gifted and a godly leader. Oh, how I wish, oh, I wish we had a Nehemiah today could advise T Dot and these other crews working on the interstate. You know, maybe they could get into something um, in less than 52 years because it seems like they are perpetually working on roads around here. But anyway, I digress. God's ultimate plan for Jerusalem was, watch this, not just a fortified wall, but faithful witnesses. God's plan wasn't just that you have a nice, impressive wall around your city, but that he would have faithful witnesses who will indwell the city. People who would inhabit the city and serve God within the city. That his purposes would be fulfilled within those walls. You see, what good are walls if there are no people inside the walls? You just have a ghost town that's well fortified. But God would keep the city through the ministry of his people. You see, it would be about 445 or 50 years later where Jesus Christ would would, would walk in this very city. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, Son of Man, the Redeemer, the Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He would He would indwell a human frame, and he would step foot into this city. Jesus Christ, a significant part of his ministry, would occur in and around Jerusalem. You see, Jesus, if you read the record, he attended the religious feasts in Jerusalem. Jesus taught the Word of God in Jerusalem. He healed people in Jerusalem. Jesus lamented over Jerusalem. He died right outside the walls of Jerusalem. You see, God was preparing His people And this place for the greatest arrival the world has ever seen, Jesus the Christ. So therefore, in Nehemiah's time, there was the unfinished business of not just building brick and mortar, but people whom God would use to to bring his redemptive plan the pass. You see... Buildings and programs do not represent the totality of God's work. Both projects were just mere means for God to reach, to redeem, to restore, to repurpose his people. We have great convocations and celebrations. We have great promotions and pronouncements. We do all those things when edifices are constructed. Yet we show, it seems to be, a minimum, a less enthusiasm when people come to Jesus Christ. We don't, 
We don't show, so, show great enthusiasm for people when they get baptized. We don't jump for joy. We don't shout. We don't celebrate when, when people are delivered from besetting sin. God has unfinished business of building his people. The redeemed of God are called to be involved in God's continuous redeeming work. The redeemed of God are called to be involved in God's ongoing redemptive work. You see, his, his redemptive grace has worked on us and works in us, but it also works through us. And although we, we will confess we are a work, we are a work, if we're honest, but we are his work. We're his work. That is why we must be loving and gracious to people because, because people are God's work. By his redeeming grace, we are, as Ephesians 10 tells us, 2 and 10 rather, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 tells us this, that we are his workmanship. His workmanship. You know, we, we, we know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? Some, you know, many of you may know this, this verse. It says, for, for by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But go on to verse 10. Don't forget verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Yes, we are a work, but we're his work. We're his people. God perfects his purposes in us when we commit to his cause. The ongoing work of building God's people. It involves, it involves, first of all, it involves watching carefully. It involves us watching carefully. Verse 1 of the text says, when the wall was built, Nehemiah here is, is speaking in first person. He says, when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem. You see, after the wall was built, Nehemiah had to appoint people to specific positions of responsibility. You see, the gates needed people to guard them because if you have strong walls, if the gates are unsecure, then people get through and the wall does no good. Nehemiah set up a neighborhood watch to protect the city. You see, Nehemiah understood that although the wall was there, it was strong, that the enemies of God would not go away just because the wall building was successful. He knew that these people that tried to keep them from building the wall would not give up and go away just because they accomplished the project. Although the completion of the wall, it stupefied the enemies. You see that back in verse 16. They were disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this was done by our God. You see, the enemy, he's, he's resilient. He's not going to just go and say, well, I lost. I'm just going to move on. No, what the enemy cannot corrupt, he will persist in trying to uh, corrupt. Or what he cannot interrupt, let me repeat that. What the enemy cannot interrupt, he will persist in try to corrupt. You see, just because he did not keep us, keep you from coming to Christ, does not mean he'll try to keep you. He won't try to keep you from living the abundant life in Christ. Just because he may have kept you from 
coming to church don't mean that he won't try to keep you from being all in while you're here at church. While, while the enemy may, may keep you from joining a church, he can't keep you from doing that. He'll keep you from being a committed member of the church. Wow. He may not keep you from confessing Christ. He'll do all that he can to keep you from growing in Christ. The enemy did not keep this church from being birthed. He did not. But he'll do all that he can to keep us from being a mature church, a unified church, a powerful, spirit-filled church. So, so Briarwood, we must be careful. We must be careful. To not let the enemy divide, to deceive, to devour us. Because Satan rejoices to see the church without power. He throws a party to see the church die. We must be careful. The Christian family even sees the most intense attacks from the enemy, from Satan. When, when you try to, to have a house, a home that will honor the Lord and seek him, he's, he's not going to let that happen without a fight. Satan does not give up territory easily. Nehemiah appointed these guards and these watchmen on the wall. He assigned godly leaders. His brother, Hananiah, a godly and gifted man. He assigned people, gave them instructions. He was diligent to make sure that what was gained would not be lost. Here we see the people of God, some even being appointed near their homes because that was important as well. Here are the people of God looking out for the good of each other. Yes, my brothers and sisters, we are each other's keeper. Yes, we are. We are. The, the, the American individualistic mindset that all of us has to fight against is not biblical. We are our brothers and sisters' keeper. So building God's people involves watching carefully. Strong leadership was needed during and after the completion of the wall. During and after. What was rebuilt needed to be safeguarded. If you're taking notes, write this scripture verse down. 2 John chapter 8, no, 2 John verse 8 rather, no chapter. 2 John verse 8 says this, Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, that we may receive a full reward. It is tempting to relax our guard after a great accomplishment, but my friends, we must continue to serve and to steward carefully all, all that God has given to us. Following up with the great wind is important as the wind itself. We must watch carefully. So building the people of God, looking out for God's people, involves watching carefully. But looking within, looking within, it involves observing honestly. Observing honestly. In verse 4, Nehemiah makes the observation. He says this, 
Now, the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not rebuilt. The city of Jerusalem being large and spacious, it, it means this literally. It means wide of two hands and large, meaning that from left to right, the city was expansive. I mean, perhaps not in how we would see a large city, but it was for their time. You see, once the walls were constructed, Nehemiah recognized that the city was underpopulated based on its capacity. In other words, more people could resettle in the city. They needed more people there. You see, the wall project would not be the essence of their existence. This project would not be some crown achievement for Nehemiah. This would not be his life work. And, and, and he observed honestly that after the wall had been rebuilt, now God's people needed to be rebuilt. The unfinished business of building people. Because most of the Jewish people had resettled outside the city. I guess you would call this Jerusalem flight. The city was so dilapidated, they did not want to live there. They likely resettled outside of the holy city because of the disrepair within it. But the state of the city, it proved this. It had run down because the people had run off. You see, if nobody is left to keep the city maintained, what happens? It goes down. What happens if we don't take care of our homes? If we do nothing, if we're passive and don't actively maintain it, 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 it runs down. I mean, just look at your yard. Just do nothing to your yard. Don't intervene. Don't pull the weeds from your, you know, from your, from your shrubbery, your flower beds. Don't cut your grass or don't treat it and see what happens. If nothing is done, it goes down. So, so the city being in this dilapidated state, it proved the people did not care. It was their responsibility. So they were not involved because they did not care. So therefore, what Nehemiah reasoned was that, well, if, if we need to get, the pe get this city back into a place of strong existence, I have to get the people back to where they care and they will mind this work once again. Nehemiah built the walls with the expectation that God would replenish his city with his people. You see, the goal was not just some ornate or some impressive structure. It was a place where God's people would thrive. You see, the goal, the goal, the goal, Broadwood is it, it's not just that we have this campus and we have a, a, a place where that, that looks good. It's not just so we have good programs so we can kind of, you know, we can kind of keep the wheel going and, and have good efficiency and have good all of these kinds of things, promotional activities. If, if we have no people that we're building, that we're pouring into, that we're discipling for Christ, it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. Warren Risby said this. He says, a city is much more than walls, gates, and houses. A city is people. I would even go farther than Dr. Wisby and say a church is much more than a building, a program, a service, or even a doctrine. A church is people. A church is people. The strength of a church is not in its properties, in its assets, the structure of its services, its strategies, its vision, its mission statements, but it is in its people called by Christ, empowered by his spirit. That's the church. That is the church. Jerusalem, you see, this holy city, it would not just be a place where the temple existed, where the wall was, 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 was there. It would not just be a, this structure where people would commute in to get the worship done and go back out. 
where they come in and check the box and return to their own world. That's not what it was intended to be. It was not built just to be a spectacle or a museum or a tourist attraction or even a religious retreat. But for God's people to inhabit and to live and to serve according to his word. Jerusalem was designed to be a community of worshipers where worship wasn't an event, but a lifestyle. I'll repeat that. Jerusalem was designed to be a community of worshipers where their worship was not an event, but a lifestyle. The church, the church is not, is, is not designed to be just a place where we come and we, we're satisfied that we just have come. But it's a place that's a part of who we are. And while we here, we are encouraged and we're fueled and we are equipped to live the life that the church really is, is a part of who we are. Not something that we do. The church is who we are. Not something we do. We are the church. We don't just do church. Jesus had great desire for Jerusalem. He said this in Luke chapter 13, verse 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, with one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers a brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus observed this place honestly. And Broadwood, if we observe our lives individually and collectively, if we observe honestly, I believe the Lord will reveal to us not just shortfalls, opportunities, opportunities to grow, opportunities to build our lives, to build others, opportunities to perfect that which is imperfected, opportunities to solve problems. You know, we're good at identifying the problems, but, but identifying the problem is just the first step. If we observe honestly, I believe the Lord will Reveal solutions. So looking out for God's people, and it involves watching carefully. Looking within involves observing honestly. But we need to look forward, and that involves obeying faithfully. Verse 5, Nehemiah says, Then my God put it into my heart. What was the answer to the problem? <laughs> It was God. You see, Nehemiah didn't just have a good idea. He had what I call a God idea. It was a good idea because it was God's idea. For it was God who put it on his servant's heart. You see, a person with a heart for God is a person who will hear from God. Why would God waste his words to speak to people who are intent on not listening and not doing? I like what Matthew Henry, that Puritan of a few centuries back, he said this. He says, what is done by human prudence must be ascribed to the, the, the direction of divine providence. You see, even if you have a heart and a mind to come and worship the Lord today, you really want to seek God, you really want, to, you want to, to really come before the Lord, that, that's not you. Because if it was up to us, we'd be at home doing something else besides being here today. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we, we, we find something else that will satisfy our own flesh. 
You have a heart to say, I want to see something done to reach people for Christ. God, that's God's idea. That's God's idea. He spoke to Nehemiah to search the genealogical record for, for an equitable opportunity among the families to resettle Jerusalem. So in other words, here's how we're going to solve this people problem. Prove the heritage, those with inherent rights who will occupy the land. The other words, those who were in the family had a right to enter the gates. Those, these people, if you look at the genealogy in the following verses, we won't read through all of that. Hey Amen, I'm sure you're saying, thank God he's not going to read through verses 8 through the end of uh, through verse 72, right? Those, that's that's quite, a, quite a bit of reading, but I trust you'll read it in your time with the Lord. But this record in these verses is the same one. Uh, this is the, the generation of people led by Zerubbabel. Ninety years earlier, we saw this people described in Haggai. Nehemiah wanted to know which families had returned so he could encourage them to resettle, to rebuild there. He realized, he realized this, that 90 years earlier, God had started the work of building his people and building Jerusalem. Nehemiah realized that God didn't just start the work with him, but God had been working in previous generations. You see, it does us good to realize that God is not just starting to do great things in our day. It's good for us to know that God didn't just start the, the, the work of, of, of saving souls and making disciples when this church first started, but God is still working in this day, that we will obey faithfully in our day, that we'll stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us and be faithful to carry on what they started. This is what he's doing. Obey faithfully. They obey faithfully. Let us carry on in that spirit of obedience. These Jews were the living link that connected the, the historic past with the prophetic future to make it possible for Christ to come into the world. Are we expecting God to do a great work? I ask you that question. Are you expecting God? Are we looking for God to do a great work in our day, in our time, in our lives, in our families, in our churches? He will do it. And if we will invest and involve ourselves, then we will see what God is doing in building people. Sure, God doesn't need us to do his work, but he's glorified the most when his people, his redeemed people, get involved in what God is doing. The unfinished business of building the people, it involves watching carefully, observing honestly, obeying faithfully. God perfects his purposes in us when we commit to his calls. Jesus, the Son of God, said this. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night comes when no one can work. That carpenter of Nazareth, he is still in the building business. He is still remodeling lives that are torn. He's still rebuilding broken souls. He is still reconstructing broken lives. He's still reconciling broken relationships. Jesus the Christ is still revisioning broken dreams. That great carpenter of Nazareth 
is still in the rebuilding business. Uh, he hasn't put down his hammer and his nails and his boards. He, he's still framing up people who seem like have no basis for life. He's still putting walls up around his people who are being beaten up on by the enemy. He's still putting a shelter over their lives to keep the storms of life from flooding them out into non-existence. Our Savior is still, he's still rebuilding the lives of people who want to be saved by him. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the good news of a dead, buried, and risen Savior. It is as God is building his house, his people, his spiritual house that Peter describes, living stones with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So, so, so we don't want to just be in the house. We want to be of his house so that he can continue to build up his people and to build us so that he can continue his unfinished business. But my friends, my friends, uh, it's going to come a day soon where Jesus Christ is going to say the job is complete. Construction has been completed. The new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth will come down. And he'll come, he will reclaim his people, the people who, who, have, who have trusted him and who have built their lives on Jesus Christ. And he is going to give his people and he's going to set them inside of a city, the city that, uh, that, that it says in Hebrews 11 and 10 that Abraham waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. One of, day, one of those days we're going to inherit that city. And the building will be done. Streets of gold. The light of the place. No need for artificial lights. We have the power on and off because it describes the light is coming from a throne of God himself. Jesus Christ will provide the light for the city. That is when building will be done. So what, what are we to do with all this? What are we to do with all this? We live because Jesus died, but Jesus Christ still is rebuilding. He is building. He is building. He's building people. So let us, let us, let us pray for God to give us a heart to want to see people built. Not, not, just, not, not just make a decision, but they're, but they're sold out, mature disciples of Jesus Christ. And let us live for that which will outlive us. Let us live for that which will outlive us.